Melissa, it's starting. Come on. Hello, welcome to worship. My name is Karen Taylor, and I'm the ministry coordinator at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in New Craig, Minnesota. For the next five minutes, I'll be sharing all of the great things happening in and around Holy Trinity. Let's get started. Well, you'll notice we have a brand new picture behind our main screen. The other thing that's new on our website I'd like to point out is we have a new prayer request button and a new contact us button. The prayer request can be used for any prayers that you have uh, for yourself or your immediate family. It, both of these buttons will go to Jamie Besick, our office manager, and she will forward them on to uh, the appropriate person. The contact button can be used to sign up for a paper mailing, an email, or our, our e-newsletter that gets sent out every Friday, or you can use this button to leave a comment, something that you feel you need to share with us. So. Those are two new additions on our homepage. Jumping over to our HTLC Connections this week, we are highlighting our First Communion that happened this past Sunday. We have had quite the week at Holy Trinity this week. We started out the week last Sunday with a beautiful First Communion for our young people and their families. So there's a great article written by our communication specialist, Rose, that you can read on our main page article. Make sure you click at the end because the story does continue and it continues on with some great pictures too. I want to give a shout out to whoever, Mr. Or, Mr. or Mrs. Ms. Anonymous, that gave our radio sponsorship in honor of our two pastors, Pastor Alicia and Pastor Ben. So thank you so much. Uh, Friday is Pastor Appreci or Boss Appreciation Week and it's also been Pastor Appreciation Month for the month of October. So thank you so much, we do appreciate you. Scrolling down, you'll notice a bunch of great new information. I don't think there's anything that's been repeated in this issue, so make sure you take your time to go through your HTLC connections. We wanna hear from you. There is a worship survey that is linked right here. So you click it, it's gonna to come to this, and it's a very short survey. It's going to take you probably less than 10 minutes, and we just want to hear your opinion. So if you could get this filled out for us by the end of the month, that would be fantastic. It will help our church council figure out what our next move will be in terms of worship. Sadly, we have to announce that uh, we lost a very beloved member of our church this week. This past Sunday, we were able to share communion with Jim and Joanne Rems at their house after we did the drive-through communion. And it was such a blessing to see him because then this past Wednesday, he passed away. So his funeral was already on Saturday. And so if you missed the funeral, it was recorded through Facebook Live. And we just wanna uh, wrap our arms around Joanne and give her lots of prayers as she goes through this time uh, without her gym. And so uh, there was a beautiful parade that was that was in honor of Jim. And so all of that has been recorded. So you should be able to find that on our Facebook pages. Some other parades that we are going to be doing. We are having such a great time using our, our big humongous parking lot in an outdoor setting that we've actually been getting together. So one of the things that we're doing is we're going to have this Halloween spectacular drive through party. So you're going to click on this link. We need you to sign up for it. And we are actually not only looking for people to participate, but also for treat passers. So if you would like to decorate a little area, maybe a table, maybe your trunk and pass out treats in a socially distant manner, we would love for you to sign up to be a treat passer. If you want to be a participant, if you um, have young kids and they want to get dressed up and have a safe Halloween, then I want you to sign up for uh, the participant slot. So there are five families that will, or five cars that will be allowed every 10 minutes into our parking lot. And so I need you to fill that out so we can remain safe. My timer. Also, we're going to be having a confirmation parade at the end of the month. So lots of good things happening at Holy Trinity. For, uh, make sure you check out our website at holyturneyonline.org for everything else. Have a great day.
welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Thank you, Jake. Good morning, everybody, and I too welcome you to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church today. My name is Ben Hilding, my wife Felicia and I are co-pastors here, and it's a joy to be able to worship with you today. And before we begin, uh, this is a community of faith. And so as a community, we rejoice with each other when we rejoice, and we grieve when we grieve. And this week, we've had the full range of experiences at Holy Trinity. So we want to give you a glimpse into what we've experienced this past week. It began last Sunday when we shared a drive-in communion service and celebrated First Communion for 21 students. So we want to just give you a quick glimpse into what that experience was like. Now many of us thought that we were scheduled for just three communion services last Sunday, but God had another plan. And what ended up happening was a, a crew of people who were still gathered together brought communion to a dear, dear member, Jim Remps. Jim and his wife Joanne uh, have been anchor members of this congregation, and Jim's health had been declining in recent days. And so we gathered together at the Rems home after the drive-in communion services for one more communion service where we celebrated that in this bread we have a foretaste of the feast to come. And just a couple days later we heard the news that Jim did in fact die. This is a, this is a sadness for this entire community of faith. So yesterday we honored Jim as Pastor Diane Goulson led a service for him at their home, but then we gathered together at the church for a memorial parade for Jim, and we want to just take a couple minutes to honor Jim before we begin in worship today. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Jim. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. <laughs> in your eyes he'll 
show it to you. Have you ever stood at the sunset with a sky mellowing red? Seen the clouds suspended like feathers? Then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen, Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, Take a look open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you stood at the cross with a man hanging in pain, seen the look of love in his eyes, then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen, Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, Take a look open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst? Seen the face of Christ in your brother, then I say, my Lord. Have you seen, Have you seen Jesus, Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, Take a look open your eyes. He'll show it to you. So may God bless the life, the legacy, and the eternal life of Jim Rips. Now may we begin our worship today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us. And for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is my pleasure to introduce this week's musical guest, a friend I met just last year within the arc and mutual interest of outdoor writing. Roy Heilman is a storyteller and adventurer with a sharp wit, keen observations, profound appreciation for time outdoors, 
and relatable character for those with and without experience in nature. Beyond these fascinating qualities and talents are even more in hiding, which brings him to us today. Roy is a tenor soloist with a Bachelor of Arts in Music with honors in performance and Master of Music degree in vocal performance from the New England Conservatory of Music. Roy lives in Shoreview with his wife, son, daughter, and two dogs. He's seen here holding his first lake sturgeon caught in my boat last month, which I leveraged into coercing him to sing for us today. Sing glory to God for all his creations, including river monsters. And thank you, Scott, for bringing the gifts of Roy to enhance our worship experience this morning. Let us now turn to the word of God found in Scripture. A reading from Exodus, the 33rd chapter. 
Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will, will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on a rock and... While my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The word of the Lord. Good morning from my grandpa's deer stand. A reading from the Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are insincere, and teach the way of God endurance with truth, and show difference to no one, for you do not regard people with partially. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him uh, Daenerys. Then, said, then he said to them, Whose head is, is, it, is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of our Lord. So as I was preparing for worship this weekend, I was thinking, okay, I know it's our third week of stewardship. I wonder how we're going to talk about that. And then I was thinking, well, I know it's also the election coming up, and I wonder how we're going to talk about that. All the while knowing that we're at the mercy of a revised common lectionary of pre-selected passages that we share with our sibling churches across the world. And so I was kind of holding my breath wondering, what is the lectionary going to have for us today? Is it going to talk about stewardship? Is it going to talk about politics? Or is it going to be something totally different that we've got to somehow magically weave together? Sure enough, <laughs> we get render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. This story from Jesus that many of us may re may be able to remember and it talks about both stewardship and politics and here we go so let's do this huh <laughs> let's pull it all together now i want to begin by saying this there are churches that are going to tell you how to vote there are churches that are out there right now saying if you really do believe in your Christian faith, you must vote this way. And folks, I want to tell you today about a value of Holy Trinity called inclusivity. We believe that we are wonderfully different. We believe the diversity of people and thought is fundamental for Christian unity. And what binds us together is a promise of God's grace, and that makes things beautifully complicated sometimes. So we are not one of those churches that's going to tell you you have to vote this way or that way. In fact, we're a church of both Democrats and Republicans, of people that are vehemently voting for Donald Trump and people that are vehemently voting for Joe Biden. We got both. And I have to tell you, I like it that way. You know, it reminds me of uh, a couple years ago after one church service in the fall, I was in the narthex drinking coffee and someone came up to me and said, nice sermon pastor, but I got to tell you, we just don't sing enough of those traditional hymns. I wish you would just do some more traditional hymns. It feels like we're getting a little too Baptisty. And so I listened to them and I appreciated them. And I said, thank you so much for sharing your 
your cares and your concerns. And I kid you not, after I said goodbye and I went to talk to somebody else, that person said this, yeah, it's good to be here, Pastor. Can I tell you something? I said, sure. I just feel like, I feel like we're just playing some of the old stuff. I wish we would do more of the contemporary music. You know, more of the contemporary songs that you hear on KTIS. Can we do some more contemporary worship music for, you know, for younger people? <laughs> I laughed to myself because I thought, okay, same service. One person told me it's too contemporary. One person told me it's too traditional. Same service. And I just thought, we are wonderfully different. <laughs> what ties us together is the promise of God's grace. We believe the diversity of people and thought is fundamental for Christian unity. Here it is in action and it's beautifully complicated. So I say that to say, we weave together a variety of worship expressions. We weave together a variety of political opinions and we are one body of Christ. We are united by the cross of Christ that transcends political parties, nations, time, and space. We are the church and I like it that way. But today we talk about how faith and politics relate. So how do you do that? Some people say, how can you talk about politics in church? And then you look to the Bible and Jesus is talking about how faith meets daily life all the time. And so if we're going to have faith matter for daily life, we got to talk about how politics and faith go hand in hand. But it's not as easy as you may think. So today our passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew, there are these two different groups that approach Jesus. They tried to kind of corner him up against the wall. The Herodians and the Pharisees. You see, there was a coin that they held, and this coin had on it a picture of Caesar. And underneath Caesar, um, it's believed that it said, Son of God. And the Pharisees knew something. They knew that if Jesus were to support the taxes, and this was a particularly unpopular tax uh, with the people. So if Jesus were to support the tax, that they, it's called the census tax. If Jesus was to support this tax, not only would it be unpopular with the people, but he'd also be committing idolatry because he would be saying, Caesar's the son of God. However, the Herodians knew that if Jesus, um, if he neglected to advocate for the tax, it was illegal and he could be imprisoned. So Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes, the census tax? Lose-lose situation, right? But Jesus was smarter than that. He didn't respond with an either-or. Jesus responded by saying, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. And I imagine both the Pharisees and the Herodians at the time were kind of scratching their heads saying, Wait, what? We thought we had him boxed in. <laughs> and I can also imagine they're saying, Wait, what's Caesar's and what's God's? How do you differentiate? Well, Jesus didn't. He left some sufficient ambiguity in his response that necessitated further reflection. So how do faith and politics relate? As we talk about it today, the rhetoric of political discourse on both sides is rich with Christian language. And yet, how do these two relate? How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of Jesus' invitation to render what is Caesar's to Caesar and render to God what is God's? Now, in the onset of this country, there was a complicated relationship between faith and politics. So contrary to popular opinion, many of this country's forefathers and mothers were not actually Christian. In fact, historians say that only about 10 to 20% of people belong to a church. 
And at the same time, many of the people who embedded religious language in the foundational documents of our country's history had also a complicated relationship with the Christian faith. Now, it's not precisely accurate to equate deism with Christianity. What was common was deism, and that wasn't uh, a Christian denomination. Deism was a way of thinking. Deism was a way of acknowledging um, the similarities between the different denominations and finding the lowest common denominator and then taking that and applying it to um, political discourse. So deists didn't necessarily ascribe to all the Christian teachings. For instance, Ben Franklin, um, he was known for respecting the role that churches had in society. He'd go to a different church every week, put a dollar in the plate, but he didn't belong to a church. And when asked, you know, did he believe in the divinity of Christ? He didn't necessarily say yes. He said, well, someday I will find that out. <laughs> Thomas Paine was really hostile towards churches. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, in fact, um, he took the New Testament and literally took a scissors and cropped out the parts that were a little more controversial but left in the ethical things, and then the ethical things became applicable to political discourse. So some of the founding forefathers and mothers of this country ascribe more to deist thinking um, rather than explicitly Christian beliefs. I mean, Abraham Lincoln never belonged to a church. And for those 10 to 20% of the founding forefathers and mothers of this country, uh, they weren't all a part of the same Christian denomination. There were people from the Church of England, the Puritans, the Baptists, and the Quakers, and each had their different kinds of belief sets. And as people headed west in this country, the Methodism really emerged uh, through the Second Great Awakening, etc., as people um, set up farming communities in the Midwest. And I say this to say the Lutheran voice wasn't really present wasn't really present at the foundation of this country's origin. Lutherans came later. And so the Puritans, Baptists, Church of England, Quakers, Methodists, they were all foundational Christian lenses into the rela relationship between faith and politics when um, this country was formed. But Lutherans came later. And so when we wonder about how do Lutherans understand faith and politics, we actually have to kind of look back 500 years to Martin Luther himself back in Germany and how he related faith and politics to see how that might help us understand the relationship today. Luther had a concept called two kingdoms. Luther said that there are these two spheres, two realms where God was active at the same time. The church realm and the secular realm. So the spiritual realm or the secular realm. And God was active in both. So it wasn't just the church realm. God wasn't confined to the work of the church. God was also working in the secular realm. And these two realms of ways that God works in this world are differentiated. Luther taught that it wasn't the church's job to control the state, nor was it the state's job to dictate the church. He didn't want the gospel to become a coercive thing where he, he wanted the gospel of Jesus Christ to be the gift, a gift that people willingly received rather than something that they had to prescribe to because it was written into law. So to Luther, these two realms were very different. In fact, when Thomas Munzer tried to set up a theocracy, which is a church-run state, uh, during the Peasants' War, Luther vehemently objected because he didn't want the gospel to be run by a coercive law. He said, we're in the business of persuasion in the church realm. That's not coercion. There's a separation, two different kingdoms, the spiritual realm and the secular realm. But Luther said, God is active in both, just in different ways. 
You see, Lutherans firmly believe that God is active in this world. God is still creating. After the first six days of creation, God didn't just sit back in God's recliner, pull up the reclining seat, and binge watch the reality TV show of creation as they fended for themselves. No, God's in relationship with us and therefore is still active and creating in this world. However, God's got two different kinds of approaches. One is in this church realm. In the church realm, God seeks to bring good news, not coercively, but good news as a gift to the world through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that God so loves them that there's nothing they can do to inherit eternal life, but God gives it as a gift. And yet, God's not confined to the work of the church. Luther believes that God is active also in the secular realm, just in a different way. Rather than trying to make people believe in Jesus Christ, in the secular realm, God's intent is to create a peaceful and just world with the question of how do we serve the common good? So whether you're Lutheran or Methodist or Puritan or Quaker or Jew or Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist were neighbors in this world. And the question of leadership and politics in the secular world is how do we create a just world of peace? How do we create a world where people are respected and loved and served regardless of their religious affiliation for the sake of a healthy and a whole world. So these two realms exist simultaneously. Passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ and passion for serving the neighbor regardless of who they are to seek the common good. Two kingdoms, God is active in both. So we know that Luther was uh, a monk who also married a nun. <laughs> and he was a theologian and a biblical scholar and everything, but he was very involved in, in his own community in ways that were not tied to getting more members at his church or not tied to making people believe in Jesus Christ. For example, he wrote a letter to all the city councils in Germany encouraging them to provide free public education for all men and women. In addition, he worked regularly at community chests to provide assistance for those who were beggars or widows or children in need. He also helped establish low interest business loans for small business owners in the community who didn't have the financial capacity to have a high interest rate on their loans. And he also advocated for women's rights. In fact, at that particular time, it was not lawful for his wife to be the executor of his estate but he made it possible so that she was just that. You see, Martin Luther was involved in the secular realm, not to coerce people into the Christian faith, but to do the right thing, to serve the common good, and to love the neighbor as thyself. So today we wonder, how do faith and politics connect? And we, I think this Luther's two kingdom philosophy helps us because it's not our responsibility to give Christianity a privileged position when it comes to the secular law. However, because of our Christian faith, we are compelled to be engaged in another sphere that God is at work. God is at work in the world outside of religious belief. God is at work in the world to create a peaceful, just, and whole society where people can get along and work together to respond to the needs of the community and seek to serve the common good. So when Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's, I think it brilliantly gives us permission to differentiate these two realms, these two kingdoms, these two ways that God is at work in this world and yet recognize that there's overlap and to recognize that in that overlap, we are wonderfully different. And that the diversity of people and thought is fundamental for Christian unity. And that we are united, not based 
on the same political affiliation or the way we vote. We are united based on God's grace for us and God's call to us to serve the common good. And that sure makes things beautifully complicated. But I like it that way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you so much, Katie and Kieran, for your beautiful mother-son duet. And now this time, we are going to 
um, share our third and final part of the stewardship series, Why Give. And you may have received one of these letters in the mail. And in it there's a commitment card for 2021. We know that there are a lot of variables <laughs> looking ahead. And long range planning tends to kind of feel like two weeks these days. At the same time, we want to do our best to be responsible as a congregation and faithful in the, in the gifts that have been entrusted to us. And so if you find yourself in a place to be able to commit uh, to a 2021 pledge, we invite you to do so. A huge thanks to all those who have already submitted their pledges. We've already had 38 the first week, and I think it was another 28 this past week send in their commitment cards. And just a quick note, you can also sign up online. Uh, in case you lost your mailing or you didn't get a mailing for one reason or another, you can also submit a pledge online and we invite you to do so. So let's listen to the stewardship team. Hello, Holy Trinity. My name is Mark Walzer. When stewardship team gathered to kick off stewardship, we asked why. Why give back to Holy Trinity? Our responses were all very similar. Thankfulness and gratitude. We were all thankful and grateful for what God has given us, and it drives us to give back to others. We each thought of different situations where someone had a need this past year. Because of the generosity and community of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, together we were ready and able to respond. As a team, we gathered and read Romans chapter 12, which describes what life in Christ and a life with God looks like. We found ourselves inspired by God's word by being prepared, eager, and ready to help. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 tells us to take our everyday life and place it before God as an offering. We need to recognize what he wants from us and respond to it. We need to be what we are made to be and not try to be something we're not. We want to share a few examples of where we have saw these gifts from God and HCLC being used. These examples were in response to someone seeing a need and being able to help fill that need in our neighborhood and surrounding communities. Jenny Walder asked me to say a few words of why I volunteer at Hope House. Uh, as servants of the Lord, I feel it's an opportunity to help those less fortunate than us. And uh, it's a great opportunity. And if you feel like you would like to do this, a few hours of your time uh, every 10th or 12th week uh, would be appreciated. And your rewards for all this are smiles, hugs, and many thanks. Uh, it's a great feeling when you walk out of there and being able to help those less fortunate than, than ourselves. Give us some thought, people. God bless. Take care. Thank you, Greg for taking the time to volunteer at Hope House. Thank you, Holy Trinity, for your support for the Hope House as part of Beacon Inner Faith. The church is helping Hope House in many ways, financially, building facilities, and volunteering. The church also raised $15,000 to help support a unit at Prairie Point in Shakopee, which helps family in need. Prairie Point is a project within the Beacon Interfaith community. As we gathered as a stewardship team, we asked, why give? Why give to God's work through Holy Trinity? And then we realized we're all called to give of our time, our talents, and our resources because we just don't know who or when or where it might be needed. We believe God is at work and there are gonna be needs that we're gonna be called to respond. So we invite you to please pray and consider how you might be able to contribute to the work God is doing through Holy Trinity this year. So why give? We give because we never know when and where it will be needed. Thank you. Thank you, stewardship team, and thank you each and every one of you for your gifts, your time, your talent, your treasures as we seek to be faithful to God's calling for us in this world. Now let us gather our first and best in offering to the Lord.
please join us in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now before the final benediction, one final announcement. A week from today, we are going to have a confirmation service. So for the 13 students confirming their faith, we're going to have a service premiered online at 9 a.m. But then, if you are able, you're invited to celebrate this Confirmation Day with uh, a parade once again, beginning in the parking lot of the First Bank and Trust in New Prague, and then circling through the parking lot of Holy Trinity, where you can honk your horn and wave to these Confirmation students on this momentous day of their life and faith. So you are all invited to join us for the parade next Sunday. But as we go today, we go to share God's love for all people from one generation to the next. And as we do, may Christ go with us to show us the way, behind us to encourage us, beside us to befriend us, above us watching over us, and within us to give us peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.